videos, just plain uh, concepts, and how they will be useful in your future. So a little bit about Palindrome itself. So basically, we are an applied research lab based out of New Jersey, and we basically do uh, anything related to emerging technologies. So we have a bunch of projects related to software-defined infrastructure, 5G, UICC, mesh head nets, so everything related to IRT, security, data storage, and we work on blockchains. And recently, we started looking at machine intelligence, the content security itself, in terms of context, fake news, those kind of topics. And uh, we are open to uh, collaborative research projects, and we have a bunch of research projects uh, with uh, a couple of universities based out of New York and a couple of in Europe as well. So here's it, and that's a little bit talk about what edge computing is and why it is required and where it could be useful. Then I'll basically apply the same model in blockchains and, uh, and try to basically combine edge computing and blockchains and how they'll be useful for carriers. And by carriers, essentially, we mean both wired and wireless carriers. Essentially, it's a network, right? And what are the open research areas and the topic itself? So edge computing, essentially, I mean, I think of it as a location-aware cloud. So essentially, the, the code itself knows where exactly it has to do the compute itself. And that's useful in some scenarios. So uh, that's what it does, right? So it's compute close to the source, where exactly the events are happening. The data is basically being generated in the network. And another way to look at it is basically move code rather than data itself. Then what are the basically drivers for this uh, uh, change? So most of it's related to network automation. So there is a lot of uh, SDN, SDN-specific, NFE, basically softwareization of whole network stack. And that's the major driver for this. And there is seamless code mobility in terms of cloud computing. You, know, you can move your VMs in dynamically from, say, one data center to another data center. That's another uh, driver for this. Then, essentially, uh, the other ones are data storage costs is basically decreasing a lot. And on the other side, it's energy costs as well is decreasing because of uh, there is a lot of storage products, energy storage as well, and there's smart grid as well, which is a, which uh, takes care of the uh, the transmission uh, and generation uh, problems as well. So essentially, uh, we can think of network itself. Network is the computer, right? So that was uh, uh, in late, I think, early 90s. John Cage, he was a chief researcher at Sun. So he basically said, "Network is the computer," and that's exactly what we are looking at. And uh, moving on, so why do we need edge computing, right? So the most prominent part, I would say, is the low latency part, right? So as soon as you want to do something in real time, and uh, that's where edge computing will be useful. And uh, of course, you don't have data transit costs, and it's basically a new revenue stream for the carriers itself. And I, mean, I would argue every carrier actually will become a cloud, edge cloud provider in the future. And so, so where this will be useful, right? So, so essentially, the main driving force is the IoT applications, wherein you have context-based uh, computation, wherein you have data generation at the source, and you want to basically compute something at the source, near the source. And a uh, classic example would be smart cities, wherein uh, you have uh, everything in the smart city. You can think of smart city itself as a computing engine. And you have all these events happening, and you want to basically compute the effects in the nearby location itself. And next uh, uh, example would be the real-time location-based services. Uh, classic example would be the autonomous transport, the, the autonomous cars uh, we are seeing, right? So you have, uh, essentially, you will uh, have, uh, 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 think of your road itself as a computing engine, right? So you have all these events which are happening on your road, and you have all these edge services which are near to your road infrastructure, and you can compute uh, in real time. Uh, think of, uh, so this is essentially the cache hierarchy. If you see in terms of latency, you can move from LAN, MAN, WAN, to finally to the public cloud, and that's where uh, the edge computing is sitting between the, uh, the MAN and the LAN layer. So that's where you will see the benefit of it. So moving on to the next topic, blockchains, right? So everybody talks about blockchain, so it's nothing to do with cryptocurrencies. Uh, so we'll talk about the, the essence, what exactly blockchains are. And I have, I actually, have, we are saying it's Internet 2.0, and we'll see why it is so. 
So what uh, blockchains are, essentially uh, think of it as a distributed ledger, right? So you have entries in the ledger, you basically maintain the state of what exactly is in your system, and uh, it provides sort of identity to everything in your system, and you can uh, verify your ownership, who owns what in your system. So essentially you're codifying this whole st uh, structure uh, in software. Uh, another way to look at it would be uh, it's basically immutable distributed state machine, right? So if uh, if a system is basically you have transacts in the system and that's driving the state of your system forward, you cannot really go back. And good thing is actually you can actually verify what really happened in the system. And the, the, the way to do it is essentially uh, uh, the consensus algorithms. So there are different ways of doing it, and that's where... Uh, the major part of research is happening, like how you can scale those things and how the consistent consistent algorithm can be uh, generated. So, uh, so, uh, so this research actually, it started way back in 80s or probably 70s as well, wherein you had uh, uh, consensus, distributed consensus algorithms, but those were sort of private, right? So you had a closed system wherein uh, the, all the security boundaries were defined. But the value uh, of uh, the Bitcoin paper was it's the, it was the first uh, verifiable public ledger. So anybody could join and basically uh, do the computation and you can trust the, uh, the computation itself. So, uh, so we talked about the, so uh, in this slide I'm actually saying what Internet 1.0 was and it actually is. So, so essentially if you see there are uh, security domains wherein you can have a constraint uh, you have four domains, and uh, you, if you want to basically compute something in the network, you have to go to a trusted party, which is the certificate authority in this case, so that you basically share a trust anchor in the system, right? So this is the model which we have been using, and uh, if you go to the, the blockchain model, so you basically remove the certificate authority altogether. So basically, uh, you are uh, delegating the, the, the responsibility of the CA within the network itself. You don't need a centralized authority. So if you take this concept further, so essentially what we are doing is we are creating a trust layer within the network itself. So, so we are removing a centralized party and we are saying, okay, let's code whatever the CA is doing in the network and you can automate the whole thing. So in terms of system, so essentially if you, see, if you break down the blockchain itself into just three entities, right? So you have a centralized entity, the asset, and you have a bunch of agents which are interacting with this entity in the network, and you have basically these interactions to, uh, generate events. So in terms of x-axis, if you see uh, uh, it's monotonically increasing, and uh, if you have your y-axis, the domain space, and when these uh, agents interact with your entity, they create events and actually in the increasing order. And whenever these events are created, they create transactions which can be stored and actually the blockchain sits on the z-axis here. And you can actually measure those things. So why blockchain will be useful? So, so if you have this public ledger sort of, right, it provides transparency in the system. So you can actually verify what happened in the system and who did what exactly in the system, right? So that's where the immutability comes in, wherein nobody can change what happened in the past. So it only goes forward. Then it, it, it provides a way for identity, identity management in the system. So everything is actually distributed. Nobody has a centralized uh, identity management authority here. And it provides a way of doing user-centric data management, wherein uh, you basically give control back to the user the users can define what, what sort of where exactly the storage or how uh, these data should be computed and shared in the system. Then essentially it's codifying the rules, right? So you have a bunch of rules in the system and you say, okay, when this, this, this event happened, you can do this, this, this things. That's essentially smart contracts. So, uh, so that's what, and essentially in the bottom line is we are doing trust automation. So we are saying, okay, uh, some, some, uh, if I can trust this event, you can move forward and do another, uh, another bunch of events in the system based on the previous event. So where this will be useful? So essentially, any life cycle tracking process, right? So be it a biological process of like uh, 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 humans actually, at, actually having a birth till your death. If you want to track a life cycle of a human, 
you can basically do that in a blockchain. What exactly you're doing, like from your birth, your education, your healthcare, your financial records, till your death, you can pretty much uh, track those things, and it's open. And in, similarly, similarly, you can do digital uh, tracking as well of digital assets. And finally, the physical assets, so the actual supply chain uh, tracking can be done with this. And, uh, and it will be actually useful in terms of if you want to observe a process, the existing process, right? So what exactly the, the existing process is doing in the system. And why that would be useful is it would provide optimization uh, opportunities. Okay, you can actually track uh, where the process is lacking and how much time the process is taking if it's a distributed uh, chain in terms of supply chain itself. Right, and once you have process observability, you can actually provide incentives to the actual agents. Right, if they are doing right thing in the network, you can incentivize them. And finally, it will uh, uh, it can provide accountability. Right, so you can actually track who did what, and you can go back to the system and say, okay, this uh, this agent does this, and that's uh, you, you can provide accountability in that sense. And uh, bottom line is essentially any system which has uh, distributed uh, producers and consumers, blockchains will be useful in that system. So, so I have a bunch of uh, uh, sort of blockchain networks where the blockchains can be applied essentially. Essentially, it's pretty much anything we interact with in our daily lives, right? So you have essential identity, then you have things like gig economy, wherein you have a distributed uh, producer and consumer market, then you have insurance, Finance, you can actually track your money, your stock market, healthcare records, education records. In agriculture, pretty much you can track where your, uh, essentially, where your food is coming from. So IBM is doing a lot of work in the space with the Hyperledger project. Then transportation, real estate, non-profits, essentially, you can track where exactly your movie is flowing in the network. If you spend $100, and you can actually track those dollars where exactly they are being spent. Then in terms of travel, uh, you booking sites, all those things you can uh, do. In the, and as well, the code itself. So that's an interesting one wherein actually you can track who changed what in your uh, supply chain of your code itself. So uh, let's combine actually blockchain concepts with edge computing. So I'm telling it's actually location of your blockchains. Essentially, that's what it is. You have... So what has changed, right? So the network can actually capture a physical event which has happened. So it can actually capture the location, right? So that's useful. So you are actually mapping events that are happening in, this, uh, in the blockchain in physical space and time. So whenever an event happens in the system, you can say, okay, you can tag that system and say, okay, this event happened at this place at this time. And so why is this useful? Essentially, it's adding another layer of assurance in the system saying that, okay, I can be assured that the event happened and where it happened, right? So this information is actually useful in these kind of networks. So these are just one uh, initial examples I could think of. So in terms of authentication, right? So there is actually a project by carriers. So they are trying to use blockchains to create authentication. It's basically network-based authentication. So, uh, so, so event happens on a, your mobile device, and network also sees that same event. So they can core it and say, okay, uh, so you can authenticate applications based on uh, blockchain itself. Then uh, advertising dollars, right? So you can actually track, and uh, you can basically mitigate uh, ad fraud as well in this case, wherein you can track uh, the ad ads being delivered on the device and whether those ads were actually consumed or it's just a clickbait. So it, there, there will be like a network sees that the ad was delivered, and the, on, the, on the device itself, you can do some computation saying that, okay, that actually was uh, viewed by the user. Then the content itself, right? So, so there is, have been a lot of talk about fake news, how you can mitigate those things. So, so the network itself sees so, uh, when the content entered the digital space, and it moved out, and who interacted with that content in real time, right? So you can track that in a blockchain itself. And uh, you, you can basically say, okay, who was the editor, who clicked, and where exactly flowed in which network. So that's, uh, yeah. So I, I, I mean, I feel that's, that could be one of the good examples of uh, blockchain in terms of content security. And finally, there are, there are projects in terms of payments. 
payment networks, then smart grid energy. So it, it's basically a distributed grid. The, right now we have centralized authorities to for energy distribution as well. So this can allow distributed uh, energy and, uh, uh, consumption as well as generation. So the last, actually, the, those are two interesting ones. So the government process itself, right? So you can track voting. So because network gives you the uh, uh, location where exactly the vo vote was done, and it can uh, it can give you can go back and check okay who voted for who, and that gives transparency in the system. And your taxes as well, right? So you can track how how your, your dollars are being spent and where exactly it's being moved in the system. Uh, these are actually a bunch of projects. Uh, so you, uh, if you go online, you will see something called distributed apps. So the, essentially, there are different kinds of blockchain stacks. And uh, so, uh, I mean, essentially, what the system is doing is all these networks have their own implementation right now. I mean, either they could be using uh, a network like Ethereum, which is a curing uh, complete network. You can build apps on top of it, or they have their own networking stacks, right? So uh, one example is Blockstack. So they have their own uh, blockchain networking stack, and they have their own DNS system. You can build applications on top of it. Ethereum is one. Then IPFS is more like information-centric networking. So those they do so though, that's like a decade old concept, but it's still prevalent in terms of uh, how context uh, content can be stored and distributed in a system. So these are the open research areas uh, in terms of scalability itself. So that's sort of related to how transactions propagate in the network and uh, how the consensus are uh, being managed in the network, right? So we have an ongoing project uh, with. Uh, uh, University of Luxembourg and uh, Hennings Group at Columbia. So we are looking at how you can scale and what's the actual the, the the essential model of the blockchain itself and how uh, heterogeneous blockchains can communicate and uh, reach a consensus. And that's the second one, actually, the interledger transactions, how they can be uh, achieved. And privacy is another thing wherein you have some uh, zero knowledge uh, transaction uh, ideas floating around. Then. Uh, Right now, these systems are actually, you can think of as, as native applications. And there is some work going on with W3C, wherein they are trying to integrate these concepts within the web and whole infrastructure itself. Then uh, finally, the software itself we just uh, discussed, right? So we can actually streamline the software distribution or supply chain of the whole, uh, uh, your networking stack or the whole software supply chain of your system itself. And that's it. Questions? Hi, it's Eric with my Georgetown hat, not FCC hat. So <clears throat> on slide uh, 13, you talked about how, okay, instead of a centralized trust entity, we have a centralized trust entity, only they don't own their machines. But we're still relying on Software card. Software, well, and it's software that's from, with probably the exception of uh, Bitcoin, from a company. It's from IBM predominantly or uh, e Ethereum. When we talk about user-centric data management, I'm trying to wrap my head around how is that any different so that if they choose to let the user control their data, then the user can. If they choose not to, they can't. I mean, I don't see the blockchain angle on it. Uh, so, so there is some actually work going on in crypto work actually going on wherein you actually have uh, uh, concept like fully harmonic functions wherein you can do computing on uh, encrypted data itself. So wherein you have token-based auth authorization. So you can say uh, there could be a blockchain wherein you uh, generate tokens and users can select, okay, my data can be accessed at this, this time. And you enforce that token at runtime by the blockchain. That's kind of magic pixie dust. Yes, it is. But that is actually there is a lot of work going on fully homo homoformic computation. So yeah, no, no, that's been going on for twenty years now. But the the, the magic pixie dust of somehow the blockchain will enforce when you can look. right. So, so the blockchain is not providing the computation part. It's actually providing this just the audit log saying that this happened in the system, and you can go back and actually check what happened. That's all it's mm -hmm. doing. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. Any other questions? Thank
Thanks. What are your thoughts on the relative importance of public versus private uh, blockchains for edge computing? Do you see this more as um, some, something that, say, run as a consortium between a few carriers um, where they perhaps can roam onto each other's edge infrastructure? Or is this more likely to be a sort of a public, I know, cryptocurrency based, you know, you have edge coins that people can earn and, and, and burn? Right. I mean, both are valid. So if you see uh, the this authentication use case, so that's actually already happening with the uh, U.S. carriers. So they are doing a bit of consortium model wherein they have uh, authentication based on network, right? And uh, the public blockchain itself will be useful in terms of government services, wherein uh, you have, uh, you want to basically, in terms of voting, right? So wherein you have a public blockchain, you can actually track who voted for who. So that's another application of the concept. And in terms of private blockchain, so that's more like uh, the Hyperledger model wherein you go to a Linux Foundation thing and you basically uh, have a bunch of companies coming together and saying, okay, this is the code we'll use for a private blockchain concept thing. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.